My question for you guys, I, I try to keep it as simple as possible. And I was explaining to some people before we got started, is I, I have three things that I feel that are super important when I'm out there walleye fishing. And, and they got to see it, you know, so that's kind of where this all comes from. So the first three things is speed, all right? Speed is important. If you're going too fast and the water's cold, those walleye don't want to chase it. You're going to get lucky. You're going to get one. But if you can slow way down, that's a huge, huge benefit. Okay. Second one is the bottom walker and fishing it effectively. So when I'm saying that bottom walkers, a lot of guys get like these three ounce lids. I run a lot of clients, so I need them to feel the bottom. So I run a heavier bottom walker. Most everybody uses a two or three ounce bottom walker. I use fours and fives. And that's just because I don't like the scope of line being out there 110 feet. I kind of want it 45 degree angle, just like we do. If you can, if you control for salmon, you can catch a ball. Okay, right place, right time. So with that being said, the the, the third one is the hook set. You don't hook set. Mm -hmm. I try to get that away out of everybody's head. Is you do not hook set when you get a walleye bite. It's like being snagged up. Once you start to see the snag then you can either start reeling I try to convince my customers to reel it in the rod holder. When it's in the rod holder, it's bouncing, it's about two, three bounces in, start cranking on it, pull up. Do not set the hook. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna miss it. I'm gonna yell at you, it's gonna get on the <laughs> We lose a lot of fish. Um, especially I found earlier in the season when it's cold up there, they're slow biters. And that's why I'm saying speed. Speed is important, keep it slow. In the summer, I think you can go faster because those fish are more active. You're gonna be catching bass, you're gonna be catching, well, when I was up there the last time, it was sturgeon, the water warmed up four degrees. Sturgeon, 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 sturgeon. So that was not a lot of fun. So with that said, when I'm seeing bottom walkers and how you fish them, is usually what I tell the customer at the end of the day, if I can take that bottom walker and stick it into your hand and it sticks, you're fishing correctly. It should be sharp, super sharp. So if you feel the end of these, they're kind of sharpened like a needle. And that's because it's properly going down the water and tapping the bottom. It taps. If it's laying over, you're not going to catch them. You need to stack it up, lose my leaders, I get angry. So, you know, you got to pick it up and you got to be able to feel that. You know, you want it, if you're within two feet of the bottom and you're just bouncing every now and then, you're going to catch fish. But if it's laid over and that thing looks like it just got drugged through the Grand Canyon, forget it. You're gonna lose a lot of leaders, you're gonna be upset. So the other thing that I have done to help that with clients is gone to the floats. So a lot of people just use beads, and that's perfectly fine. What I have found when I'm running the floats is it helps float that bait up off the bottom. So you don't want to drive it. If you're bringing up clamshells, probably not. So I run, the, I run the, the floats on there. A lot of times, if I've got a combination that works real good, the back float is completely gone, shoot in half. So you know you got a good one going. Three hook rigs for the people that miss a lot. I am included in that, and it happens, all right? I get excited, I set the hook too. So I also use the slow death hooks, they're a little bit bigger. You put them on there. You know, they say that you can't make it turn, with the worm on there, if you add on the hooks, I don't care if it's turning or not, it doesn't matter to me. As long as the worm's out there and it's not in the J weird thing, they're gonna get, they're gonna take them. So I went to the three hooks this last time I was up there because I was getting a lot of short biters. I was getting the worm busted in half. Very frustrating, you know, you've got 10 in the box, you've missed 50, for goodness sakes. You know, it, it starts to wear on you a little bit. Um, so I go to the three hook rig, I don't even have to put the center hook in if you don't want to, but I lay the worm out. I'll smack it on the side of the boat, kind of stun it a little bit, lay it out, get it, get it on there real good. So with that being said, line speed, angle, and the boat. I mean, if you're going down through there and you can slow your boat down to two, whatever, I'll turn my Minkoto completely backwards and troll backwards going down the river. So you got to kind of get used to that because you'll go all over the place. But once you get that figured out, you can slow down. So like if you've got ground speed of three miles an hour and you're just cooking down through there and you can't get bit, you just slow down, put your kicker in reverse, use that Minn Kota. I almost never use my, my, my kicker if I can help it. It's always the Minn Kota. 
unless it's windy, I got a big boat, I can slow myself down, I can steer that way. So that's huge, you gotta slow down. And when you set that hook, there's a lot of variables. Everybody thinks walleye is so aggressive, you're gonna hook it and you're gonna get it in. No, it'll hit the palate of that mouth and half the time the hook's not even in the fish. You'll net it, it'll fall out, there's no hooks in it. So unless you can get in the lip, you know, get it to choke it, a lot of times they'll fall out when you get them in, okay? Um, you know, location-wise, we were talking about that before, before we got started. Um, when I'm up there fishing jigs now, I don't even use my, my depth finder. I mean, yeah, I'm looking at it for depth. I'm not trying to find fish anymore. When I'm going down through there, as soon as I hook the fish, I put a waypoint. So I kind of confuse people because I'm going down through there. Oh yeah, we're coming up on a, on a palm tree. They're all looking on the beach. What's going on? It's on my craft, on my GPS. So every time I hook a fish, I put a waypoint. And so as I'm more harness and going through there, I'm aiming at more at waypoints. Yeah. You keep saying going through there. Where are you talking? About? So yeah, when, I'm, when, when I'm fishing up through there, it's it's below below below, below John Day, so bigs. Okay. I fish a lot from the the boat ramp up there, right below John Day. Um, I fish down at forty two. Yes. What, what river is that? The Columbia. Thank you. Columbia. Um, so I, I I try to stay away from the people as much as possible. You know, try not to be that goat. Um, a lot of times I'll be down there, the car body bowls, what they call it, um, down below. There's a hundred boats down there, and you go through there and you don't see anybody hook fish. Leave. You know, but the other thing is, is your best fish finder is your eyeballs. If you see my boat with all the fish finder graphics on it, and you cannot miss it, if I'm in the same spot for two and a half hours, there's a reason. Go up there and check it out. You know, I mean... That's, that's, I'm not hitting a spot because there's no fish there. I'm going there because I hit fish and I hit fish again and I hit fish again. So your best fish finder is your eyeball, okay? Um, for rods, any rod will work. You don't need a long rod. I'm using the Kuma Deadeye uh, bottom bouncing rods, so they're, they're made for this specific fishery. You know, I only use them for walleye. They got a real soft tip on them. So when that, when that rod's going down through there, if you guys can see that tip, I'm, I'm looking for the jiggle on the tip. So if I'm constantly jiggling, 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 one crank, okay? If it never hits, I tell them to let a little bit of line out until it taps. The more you work your rod, the more fish you will catch. If you just set it in the rod holder and never maintain that thing, forget it. You know, you're gonna catch one now and then, but the more you work the rod, and stay in contact with that bottom, play with it. Half the time I hook my fish and I'm just cranking up to get it off the bottom. Oh, hey, there's one. You know? Yeah. So, Bill, <clears throat> when we troll for salmon, um, my angle, you know, the 45 degree, we're all looking for that. Sure. We adjust our lead, our speed, whatever. Line angle play a part of walleye fishing? Yes and no. So, it depends on how much lead you're using. All right, a lot of time when I get going and people put their gear in the water, they're like, oh, my spinning's not spinning. Don't care. Half the time, I don't think that thing's spinning anyways. It's just going back and forth. I'll, I'll, I'll not use a blade. Just use the pills. You get them that way too. I think when you're going that slow, because we are going slow, like bottom current's faster than it is up top. You put it down, it's gone. So once you get it down there and you get your line angle going, I try to keep that 35, 40 degree angle. I try to keep that line speed, you know, the speed two or slower. When it gets hotter, I mean, you'll catch them at three miles an hour, but if you can slow it down, you'll catch more. So, um, line counters, yeah, you guys don't need line counters. When I've got five or six rods on the boat, line counters, because the guy in the front wants to fish past the guy in the back. And those tangles take me a long time to get it figured out. <laughs> so, you know, this, this particular um, Akuma convector, you know, it's got a flip and switch on it. For me, it's it's huge when I've got the boat in my hand and I'm trying to bait stuff. I want a little, little bit of line out. It's just like a fast flip and switch. That way, I can let a little bit of line out, find the bottom. Most of the customers, I don't tell them about it because it's just a mess. So for the guys that are running the boats, it's a huge thing when you want to just let out a little bit more line and not have to worry about flipping the handle back over. It'll automatically do it for you. Um, and what type of rod is that? It's an Akuma Deadeye. 
So it's the Dead Eye series, and it actually will collapse two feet down. If you've got a smaller boat, it'll collapse down into the shaft. When I originally bought them, or when I originally got them from Akuma, I had no idea that that did that. I'm like, well, I didn't worry. So you can make it shorter than you want it. Yeah, I don't like it to be as shorter. <laughs> so if you don't ever do that, they do, they do collapse, they, they will collapse. And this doesn't have to be the rod you use at all. I mean, I use Akuma, uh, um, what do you recommend, what do you recommend for size-wise? Uh, most of these are all seven and a half, eight foot. Okay. So these are all seven tens and they're six to 20. Um, I use fluorocarbon, you don't have to use fluorocarbon. I'm just a fluorocarbon guy, I don't know what the deal is. I, I like it, you can't see it. But while I, while I have the guys, right, they can see everything. Okay. So the hook setup, three in a row, two in a row, a lot of times I don't have that center hook in there, but you gotta space it out to where your worm's at. As your worm artist and you're going down through there and you keep getting bit and the tail's gone, I swear they know where that hook's at. Because you'll just get hammered. You'll reel this thing in, oh, how, the tail's gone, or you got puncture marks in it, and you're like, what, what just happened? That thing was getting throttled. Yeah, you don't miss about 90% of them when you get started. Are those the hooks with the bend in them? Yeah, yeah, they're called slow deaths. This, this particular one is just a, a bass. It's a, the bass jigging. What, what size? I believe this is a four. But I've tried everything. I've gone three hooks, I've gone two hooks. I've spaced them out huge. I have found, uh, I, my uncle comes down from Idaho as well and he brings Idaho worms. Don't use those, they're huge. <laughs> I think they scare fish. I mean, I had to cut them down I can, so I'm just saying they're, they're, they're pretty large. So, you know, a lot of that is, is line speed. And you know, when you see somebody like me that's got five people in the boat and we're smashing fish, I got six or seven rods in the water. There's a reason. I, I've got a lot of bling down there. Same thing when you're salmon fishing. If you're going to catch more because you got more rods out. I want to put as many rods as I can, you know. So when I'm fishing, I usually try to keep customers to 10 fish a piece. you got five or six people in the boat, I'm cleaning the fish for a while. Yeah. Um, Lonnie actually showed me a really cool way to clean the fish this last time. I never even thought of it. using a fork. I'll show you that some other time. I'll do a video or something. It's super cool. I, I, I get to the point where I just want to whack those fish and get them done. I want to go home. I want to sleep. He actually showed me a little bit better way to get that meat off of there and actually save some of that ribcage meat and it, and it was really effective. So um, I'll do a YouTube thing on that or something at some point. Um, so this is the worm hearts and part. Super easy, I do it with my clients because it is so easy. Put your line down to 30 feet. I'm gonna start going, we'll adjust as we go. Biggest thing is, is if the person has never worm hearts before and they wanna hold it and they feel that first bite, I guarantee you they're gonna miss it and they're going to jerk it right out of the fish's mouth. So I try to encourage them to set the rod on. Yeah. You talk about a couple things. Two miles an hour is what you like for speed? I'll go slow. Slow. As you slow know, as you can go. As slow as I can go, and I still think I get, I've got this up. That's why I put the floats on. That's with the current. Yeah, you're going with the current. And sometimes while there's flowing water up there. You get out there and you get started, and you're like, OK, the water's flowing really fast past these buoys. I kind of get out of the middle, I go to the edges. So when I'm talking about fishing the Columbia up there, when I take away and I leave from the launch, I don't even fire my main up. I start right there, I go down the Oregon side, if I don't pick anything up there, I go 100 feet out and I go to my next mark. And I will do that completely across the river until I find where those fish are at. If they're not there, they're not there, not biting, go down, you know, we. You gotta search sometimes, they're not always easy to find, but you know, with enough rods in the water, you usually find them. Um, if I find a spot that has a lot of fish, and we've got some guys up there that, that have gotten really good at the jigging. I love the jig, but with clients a lot of times, they don't understand the contact of the bottom and it gets expensive for me. I start spending a lot of money on jigs. So, I mean, I can say one year I actually lost a lot and I quit. Yeah. They bite the end of the worm off. Are you changing the worm off? I do. Time? So, even if they take just the very tip of the worm off, I do. Change. Fresh worm off. Well, I don't like the one when it doesn't have a tail. Yes. How long is the leader? The leaders, I. Some guys like them really. I'm this guy. I do this. That's how long my leaders are. I'm not that particular about it. But normally, it's, this is about four feet. 
This is about what I do my leaders. I do all my wall leaders. I whoop, do this, tie them up, put them on. That's for me. We last <coughs> week we got some short buyers, so we started pinching the end of the worm. See, my issue is with that is I think that they like to wiggle from the end of that one. Okay. And, well, we still leave that much behind. So if you're getting short bit that much, lengthen your leader and put that back to the farther. Yeah. Put it further back. Like some of these, some of these I have on here are almost two hand lengths. So depending on how hard I'm getting hit, and this is what I'm talking about by if you if you get one that's working really, if I can get it off. So this one was working really well. There was two white pellets on that when it started. There's only one white pellet, and somehow they managed to bust all the, the beads too. Got me. Wow. But that I was I fished that for like a week. I just kept running it. They're like, there's nothing on that. Just wire to the back. Gary is the smiley blades. I am not a fan. I don't catch as many on it. They work. Um, but I'm not a super fan on the smiley blades. I like I like iron and blades. I like DIP, Simon, Simon. I'm not particular. I'm on I'm on pros staff for for VIP. But to be honest with you, Simon has got some really cool blades out now that have worked really good for me this year. And Pro doesn't have those yet, so I'm working on it, grinding on it, get those done. Can you get those up at their store in Woodland? Yeah. At yeah, Woodland? Or yeah. Rufus? Rufus. Talking about Rufus? No. It, is it uh, uh, Hawkins store in Woodland? The what? Hawkins. Hawkins? Hawkins? Yeah. Oh, you can. I've been, I've been getting them up there at Rufus. Yeah, Rufus at the They're store. only place that actually has the walleye blades I'm talking about. So if you. Oh, okay. If you go up there and you want to find them, yeah, those counted. <laughs> <laughs> so th th this pattern is what I've been doing really well on this year. So it's just the dots, purple. I mean, and every day is different. You've got to be well, and that's why they're quick change clevises. I will sit there. One rod's not getting bit. I'll flop on this one, and that one will start working. You know, back in the day, it was always like. Brass, gold, silver. Yeah. Ah, now I've run rainbow and polka dots. Doesn't matter. Three dollar Yeah, <laughs> catch them. You know, so it, it's just a matter of. I mean, I, I've run spin blows and yeah. got. You know, so it's just a matter. You do the whole thing set up the same way on top. Put a spin blow. It'll work just good. Hand it'll float. So the next thing, uh, trolling, trolling plugs. I'm not an expert at it, it pisses me off. Um, <laughs> so I use a trolling app, you know, we're using plugs early in the season up there in Aragon. These are the ones we're using. So I use the trolling pro, 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 troll solutions. Um, you know, when you can put in what plug you have, it's by Berkeley, it'll tell you how much line you need out at that speed for that depth. We can't always get it down to that depth. Maybe you're fishing deeper. So. They have these hooks set up, just like for your downriggers, for your clip releases. If you want to get it deeper, put that on the clip about, I don't know, 50 feet in front of the plug, drop it down, that'll get you lower. Um, I've had times where I couldn't quite figure out if I was working the bottom correctly with the plug. I'll put a bottom bounce around it. Put the bottom bounce around it, it's on the bottom, you know the plug's on the bottom, run it that way, I caught them like that. I only run plugs in the winter when I first start. Up for the big girls. So there's a lot of guys that night troll for walleye. That's not me. I'm not going to do that. I don't know that area that well, so I'm not going to do that. So that's just plugs, real quick. They are effective in the winter. I'm trolling upriver with them. You're putting that bait in front of their face a long time. Usually they'll get mad enough they'll finally take it, and it's usually a big one when you run that. Usually pretty big. Um, jigging. We we're talking about at the beginning. So when you're jigging, I go out and find a rod that is as light as possible. This thing's pretty light. You can hold it all in. I got bad shoulders. So when I went and found these, it's a Dead Eye Series 2. It does not have to be in a Kuma Dead Eye. You can run anything. You can run a Shakespeare for all here. It doesn't matter. As long as it's light, it's not going to kill you. All right? So when I combined these, I went for the lightest one I could because you're going to be jigging a long time. All right? When you start jigging, a lot of it is boat control. You need to get the same speed going back as the current is, or you're gonna have jigs that are out there about 500 miles and never hit the bottom. 
Okay, so it's boat control. The captain needs to be in control of that. I took one of those guys up. They wanted to jig. Took a little bit while to get everybody kind of focused in on what we're doing. Whack, start hitting fish. As soon as I get the boat control right, feel on the bottom, kind of playing with it. A lot of times these walleye, when you're jigging it, don't necessarily want to see that jig come away off the bottom. All right, that's why there's not much paint left on these. So as we're going down through there half the time, if you watch, most of the guys are out there jigging, it's about how far they're in the rut. It isn't just bottom fishing stuff, okay? I have found, God, I got one already, that's sweet. So I have found when you're jigging these, half the time you hook a fish when you're jigging a walleye, it's not in the mouth. It's gonna be under the chin, okay? So what these fish will do is they'll get up on top of that plug, or excuse me, the jig, Right now. So what they'll do is they'll get on top of this jig, as you're jigging it, they lay on it to protect it. This is the only explanation I got for it because I get a lot of fish under the chin. And they all die. So, <laughs> so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference between worm harnessing and jigging. When we go to jigging, now you got to tell the guys, I don't care what you feel. If you feel something, you set the hook, I don't care how hard. Set the hook. Nine times out of ten, it's not in the mouth. I say that the time we were up, he was up with me jigging. Half of them were so deep throated that we didn't snag them, they were in the mouth. So I think the more fish that are around and you're jigging, they'll get right up on top of that and they'll lay on it. And as you pull up, you say, I mean, I'm not kidding. Half the fish I get when I'm jigging, I get ah, underneath the chin. So small, a lot of times they want this thing just barely bouncing along the bottom. Barely, barely going, you know. It's not, it's a finesse thing. You gotta get used to it. Yeah. Are you running a swim bait on that jig then? Worm. Oh, okay. Put a worm on it. <laughs> so I run a stinger hook on these two because it'll make you mad. So you put a worm on there, you start jigging it. Oh, missed one. You really love the half the worm's gone. So then you start getting angry, and you put the stinger hook on, you start hooking them on the stinger hook. So I don't do anything fancy when I put these stinger hooks on either. It's literally tied loop. I loop it over the top of it, slide it on there, pull it on tight. So when you put the worm on, it'll slide up out of the way, and you put this back in the tail. That's it. Stinger hook at times very important because you're going to be setting the hook. If you set the hook, oh, half my worm's gone. Reel it in, put another worm on there, put it back down, and do it again you're gonna get a stinger hook if that happens too often. And a lot of times I have to do that. When I run these also, I do not run it to my, my braid. I'm using a bumper and it's it's 10 pound test model, uh, fluorocarbon, I run that to it. So if you get snagged up, it'll actually snap off, it won't take me an hour to get it all rigged back up. Preference, you can go right to it, but when you get snagged up, you're gonna break some stuff. I use it a lot. Yeah. Let's go back to the blades for a second. What's the range of size of blades you use and what dictates when you change to a different size? Other than just thinking the fish, it isn't it is quite a small one. So, you so that's down. that's my advantage compared to you guys go by yourselves and you're two people in a boat. I've usually got five or six rods in the boat. Nobody has the same one when we start unless I've really been crushing them on something. So, you know, I'll use little radium blades, the little, little number ones, the little bitty guys. And that's what it used to be all the time. I don't typically like to go over to like a 4.0 is the standard size for like this, the assignments and stuff. So I have some bigger ones in there that I have done well on too. So it's just a matter of playing with it. You know, if I've got a rod that's not getting bit, that thing's gonna start getting the blade changed on it until it gets bit and then I'll change it up. So the last time I was up there, and this is, is kind of crazy, I lost it, so it was frustrating, but it was actually one of uh, VIP's, I don't remember what the name of it is, but it was white with a green dot on it. He brought it out last year. I picked the thing up, I'm like, I'm gonna take that up there and see if it works. Holy moly, it worked great. I only took one, so I lost it on the sturgeon and I was pretty upset. So it's just a matter of playing with it. They want a different color. You know, once it starts getting really sunny up there, the white wasn't working that great. Start going to a, a brass, a copper, um, but those weird color combos from Simon working really well. And somebody figured it out because I went back in there the next week to buy the rest of them, and they were gone. So somebody figured it out. I was very nice. Um, 
<laughs> so, you know, with that being said, it's, it's, it's about being comfortable when you're digging. Um, it, it gets tiring, you know, especially if you're not just hammering one after another. It's, you gotta stick with it. And the only way you're gonna get better at jigging with for walleye is if there's a tough one there and the bite's really good, or you keep doing it. And, you know, I don't like to do it a lot with clients because they lose a lot of gear. I, I hate to say that, but, you know, that little jig is like five or six bucks. So you don't need to buy these. You can go out and you can get, you know, the mold. And that's what I did. I went out and got the mold and I will melt up the ugliest things and I dip them in my paint and I do all sorts of crazy stuff. The paint's going to come off anyway. So half the time I just leave them lit. Works just fine. So one of the things you guys need to keep in mind if you're going to start doing this is the bottom lockers. So the Walleye Club, when they're over at the Sportsman Show, sell all those bottom lockers. You can't always find the heavy ones. So the fours and fives, you can't just walk into a store. Half the time they don't have them because they don't realize that. So a lot of times when I'm up there, I'm running those heavy jigs, those heavy bottom lockers. You need to have them, you know, just in case. I, last year, was starting right in front of the ramp. There's a 100-foot hole there. I would drop that four-ounce lead in that 100-foot hole. As I'm coming up that hole, I was getting seven or eight fish before I ever plateaued into the 60 feet. And then I went from 60 to 30. Of course, with that being said, the sturgeon were laying there in there too, so if you laid it too long, you lost my hair. Um, but you gotta, you gotta be willing to try stuff like that, you know? And, and, Jack happened to be up there and he saw what I was doing. He's like, how are you getting it down? I'm looking at his lead. I'm like, well, for one, I'm not using a two ounce lead. Oh, so kind of caught on to that, you know, but it, I, I just like to be able to get it down, get it on the bottom so you can feel it. Like I said, working the rod is huge. Um, I didn't bring any worms. I brought some rubber worms I can hook up for you. If you need to see it, it's a worm. Look at on there. Everybody asks me, do you put sand on your worm? It's a worm. It's supposed to be wormy. I don't put anything. Um, my plugs, I will put walleye. I got this thing, you know, uh, Shane has a great walleye scent that I put my plugs, I put on my plugs and stuff. Um, but that's about the only time I ever do that, you know. Um, there are some guys that are up there jigging that are doing really well on this. We didn't do very well on it, but they're doing it. And I tried it, it works. So you can. You do not have to use regular worms. You can put on the gulp alive little shad minnows, um, the yums. I mean, we, I watched a couple of guys up there, they crush them on these things. I did better on worms, so worms. And here's another trick for worms. My boat gets disgusting. Worms are disgusting. Worm poop, worm, worm stuff everywhere. It doesn't matter. So take your worms out of that and put them in moss. Lunch of that. So being part of a club is a huge deal. When I first started out, I joined the walleye club. I figured I could learn something more about it. I want to make money out. I want to be as efficient as I can. Join a club. That's what I did. And those guys, they're a great group. Same thing, you fish outs all the time. So what I'm seeing also with the max lures, you know, the, the, the smiley blades, they work. If you don't want to build your own stuff, Go buy these. They work fine. It's got a it's got a slow death hook on it. Um, some of them the hooks are huge. But I don't use those. I just tear them apart, make my own. So I have a lot of crap days in my shop, building things, and stealing my wife's fingernail polish to make plugs and stuff. So, um, but yeah. So the Max Smiley blades work. It's just not something that I prefer to use. Um, they do work. I just don't catch them in fish. Up, so. Anybody else got any other questions? Yeah. So at the water depth, we were up there in February, and we saw both really similar to yours. <laughs> 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 we're going to miss that thing. This gentleman's fishing in some water that I'm thinking, I have never fished over 30 feet of water with a walleye, and I was shocked. For the last five years, really, those fish have been deep. Right in the middle of the river, right down the gut. I mean, they'll move. If you don't get them in the gut anymore, yeah, go, go farther over. Um, but you know what puts those fish there, though? Why that time of year? I don't know. They're there, so they're in there. Well, always. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things that I, I was, I think we all start off a little shallower when we start, you know, and, and some of the guys do pretty good over there, and they're telling me, oh, I'm catching them over in 30 feet. I'll go there and we'll catch a thing. Go back out to 60 feet, fish on. So I pretty much stay from 30 feet to 60 feet 
when I'm up there above and I'm dropping in 100 foot. Water's a little cooler. I, I think they're just sitting on that. Thing. And if you actually do put it on your fish finder, you can see them sitting there. You just got to get in front of them and bite. And literally half the time we're dumping in up there in that deep water, we've got a fish on before they even click it over and I'm moving. You know, so deep, deep, deep water. You know, I uh, that little heart that's on the, on the wall there, it's kind of my, once I'm in the middle and I get to the heart that's on the wall, I'm watching rocks. Yeah, I was shocked. I just I have never seen anybody go that far out or out in the middle, see the one yeah. side or the other. And yeah. Just kind of and I've been going all the way up past to the platforms and doing that all the way through. Sometimes they're up higher, sometimes they're down lower. You watch the jiggers go through there. Those guys, they got it figured out. They're going right through the middle, they're jigging that thing, they're whacking fish, and I go right down through the same spot and I catch them as I'm jigging. You know, but in the same sense, I call it the Hall of Fame troll because it saved my rear end a few times. But the island that's up there, I will go all the way to the top of that thing and I will troll that island all the way down. And it's not like you're picking up a fish every five seconds, but about every 30 to 40 feet when they're in there and everybody's out in the middle and they're, they're just pounding on that, I think those fish move away. And so then I go over there and I'm the only one there. And that's why I'm saying when you see somebody do that, I don't give it to you. And I see you do that five times in a row, I'm like, but I'm gonna troll right behind you, I'm gonna lost duck you all the way down that thing. If you catch fish, I'm gonna keep doing it. You know, because I'm there to catch fish too. You know, and I just, yeah, I mean, you guys are skinny. You guys are pretty far back. I mean, you need to be a little respectful. Well, the thing is, it's probably fish, you're fishing deep. You know, it's not like you're spooking those fish, it's not like you're salmon or kokanee fish, you know, you're kokanee fishing, you're long line, and some guy's right on your gear, and you're looking back there, and you're like, my gear's gonna go in your prop any minute. You know, it's like you're trying to get out of the way up there. Eh, you know, it's it's not quite such a big deal. So, anything else? I think you got a question. Yeah. You mentioned about islands. Have you ever fished like from 205 to Bonneville? Yeah. It's just not as good as it used to be. Um, in that time of year, I'm usually busy chasing steelhead and salmon. So I don't normally get down to do that, but. Usually right at the end of spring season, if you pay attention to the guys going in the channel over there and they're not salmon fishing, they're walleye fishing. Just saying. You keep an eye on that, go up there every once in a while and make a pass. It's pretty good and they can usually be pretty, pretty large. I was talking about the Columbia from 205 Bridge up to Sandy. Yeah. In that area? Well, it used to be really good right there out of Washougal. Um, the reports I've gotten from the last few years, it hasn't been that great. I don't fish it because I'm busy chasing other fish at that time. So I heard it's been better down by the two five bridge. Yes. So it's just a matter of I mean last year I think John Plugoff caught a walleye down at Tone Point. Really? Well what are they doing down there? You know, salt water for goodness sake? Yeah. I was talking to say about we fish out of Camus Walshoot and there's an old guy out there that only fishes for walleye. Huh? He got a nine pounder last year. Well, you know, when I was there out, when I was a kid, we used to fish off the dock right there all the time. We used to catch huge walleyes. Yeah, yeah. We used to catch huge walleye off of it. I really haven't seen them come off there. But then again, I'm not there. I see everything. He know. doesn't use anything but a worm furnace and a, a three ounce rope. That's mm -hmm. it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's super effective. You cover a lot of area. If you're jigging, like I said, if I'm jigging, I'm going through there. And I've got a bunch of waypoints, and it's been the same day, and I'm catching those fish there. Yeah, you got if you got customers that, or in my case, customers that can do it and can jig, super effective. I mean, if the bite's on fire, I would rather sit there and jig and catch those fish that way because you can just one after another and you don't have to run the boat. Saving fuel now, that's pretty pretty big. <laughs> so still yeah, up and down the river when you're doing that. Yeah, we're just real slow. I mean, nine times out of ten, the current's strong enough up there that if you try to just spot lock. With your with your mentor, all your gear is going to flare out so bad you're never going to get to the bottom. So it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, side drifting with bobbers, eggs, whatever you're doing. You got to keep that walking speed going. So your guys are jigging like this, and if you're going too fast, they're jigging, but the line's way out there. They're never going to find the bottom. So you want me going about the same speed as a girl? Yeah. So if it's two miles an hour, I try to do two miles an hour. The best time I find for it to jig up there is when that water is not flowing very hard. Because then it's easier. You can get, you can get right on top of your gear, you can jig that thing, and, and it's super easy. If it's going too fast, more marks. 
He is saying up a bunch, worm bars, because that costs money. So, <laughs> worm bars. It's just easier. The worm bars thing, you can just keep going on lines. I just, when I say lines, it's the whole river. Once I find a section that's hit four or five times, I'll hit that until I don't hit another fish. And then I'll go back over to the other side, and then I'll hit that side. A lot of times, I don't even make it down past the gravel bar that's there to the next section that we fish or down to John Day. I, I hardly ever make it down there. Usually when the fish are up top there, I stay there. Don't leave fish by the way. So you're above the, the bridge that goes across? The, oh yeah. That big? Yeah. Yeah, usually, you know where the, the where they camp out there on the rocks? On the gravel bar? No. It's right by Rufus. Oh. So that section up there, when it starts going there, I hardly ever even make it down past that spot. I will sit there and run that. You know, I hate to say this because it was, my uncle and a whole bunch of people came down from Idaho and I said, okay, I know you guys aren't coming down again, go for it. So the last two days I fished it last year, I never went below that point and we killed 75 and 99. And that was about a week from now. So it just depends on the weather. I think the colder the weather is, the more lethargic the fish are, the harder they are to catch. The warmer it gets, like, as soon as the water hit the 42 mark, this last time I was up there, the sturgeon started biting everything. We couldn't catch sturgeon before. But the last two days I was there, it was like almost every pass had a sturgeon. It was killing me. So the hotter the water gets, I think the more they get, you'll start catching bass a little later. So it's smallmouth bass, walleye, kick pick, carp, squawfish. You catch them all right now, it's pretty cold. Isn't it, still? It, it is. It's about 42. The whole time I was up there earlier this season in January, or yeah, January, it was like 30. Bye. It was cold. We we're freezing our butts off. Um, but it started to warm up a little bit. Now this cold snap, I think, probably slowed down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You said that you only run the plugs during the winter months. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually only do it up at up at ear or uh, ear gone. Because it's less snaggy. You can get away yeah, with so it. So we do it when July when we fish in Matilla, we run the plugs. But we yeah, we, we, run them at night. we were chose to run them at night. Yeah. Because just because it's fun. Yeah. You know, not being able to see your reel go off and you just hear the <laughs> Well, you know, the miscon misconception is people think that these walleye are going to fight. My best explanation to it is you just took it into a wet towel and now you're running it in. Yeah. You're not up there for the fight. You're up there for the meat. You're up there for tacos. Right. So, you know, if you're going up there because you're going to have a real just random line, it's not going to happen. You know, I think the biggest one I've caught is 13 and a half pounds. Hooked it, reeled it up. Maybe it's a sturgeon. <laughs> oh, okay. Way to let it go. Yeah. You know of any lakes, specifically in Oregon, that uh, that do well on walleye? Lonnie probably has a better answer to that than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you wanted to go east in Washington, uh, you know, banks Owls. up through there, owls. Really good. Like Austin Mosher's up there. He's one of my partner boats. He's up there, and they're doing really well. And he almost exclusively jigs it. So, no current. It's, it's super good. I wanted to also mention that the two and a half to three and a half pound fish are the best eater fish. We actually. We let them go. People that catch over five pounds let them go so they have greater fish to make more fish. And the way I look at it is I'm trying to make this fishery something I want to keep fishing on. So anything over that five, six pound mark, it goes back. Those those girls have got a lot of eggs in them and it keeps our fishery going. I, I want to keep fishing on it. You know, I got into an argument at the last meeting or the last seminar I did. Uh, one of the guys is telling me, oh yeah, you know, these, these wally eat so many salmon. They eat so many salmon. I was like, well, I don't know about that, but I probably cleaned a thousand last year and I got mud dollars. I have never seen a smoke. So I have to yeah. that. So you you don't you do not think that they um, I don't think it is the, quite the impact that everybody thinks it is. Okay. You know, I mean Lonnie can probably attest this too. I mean, how many smolts have you pulled out of a gut? Only shad we see. Shad, mud daubers, leeches. Because they're on the bottom and usually the sand will fly up. Yeah. You know, and that's that's one of the things. Yeah. And I will say when that is a true fact, because I learned my lesson over at Oh yeah. I caught a ten and a half pound one of the first fish walleye. It was the first walleye weekend I've ever fished, and I just annihilated it. Right? Mm -hmm. and you did better than us girls in our derby. But get, the getters <laughs> lot. Yeah, I was pretty excited. <laughs> this ten and a half pound fish, I'm thinking, 
Yeah. That is a big fish. Yeah. Right. So I keep it. I go back to the marina and I take all my fishing while we're going to clean them back and I go like a lynching almost. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, prob I probably would have put that thing away and killed it myself. Yeah, you know, it's it's a personal But I didn't know. And I yeah. Didn't, but I, well, when they explained it to me, I understood. I totally yeah. understand why you would come, but I didn't know. It's it's a personal thing, you know. It, it's not a law. No, it's not. You know, 